you have your Bibles with you, turn to Ephesians chapter 6. Spiritual warfare has been a theme here at Shorter Road Baptist Church over the last couple of months. And it's been that way because spiritual warfare is so real. And quite frankly, it's something that uh, a lot of churches don't focus on anymore. And a lot of people don't want to face and don't want to admit. A lot of the problems we have going on in the world right now comes down to spiritual warfare. We are uh, Ephesians chapter 6. Once I quit here and pages turn, we'll read through it and then have a word of prayer and we'll get into it. Ephesians chapter 6, starting at verse 10. It says, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God, that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness in this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand. Stand, therefore, having your loins girt about with truth, and having on the breastplate of righteousness, and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit. And watching there too with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. And for me, that utterance may be given unto me, that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel. For which I am an ambassador in bonds, that therein I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. Let's pray. Precious and Heavenly Father, we just thank you for your word. God, as we sit here and prepare ourselves for this message, I just pray that you will open up our hearts and our minds, that you will help us to understand your word, and that you will just soften our hearts where it needs to be, that you will place conviction where it needs to be. God, I pray that you will bless this message, that you will bless this service in this church. And Lord, I pray that these be your words and not my own. And in Jesus' name, amen. amen. So we've been talking about the whole armor of God. And I'm just going to reiterate a little, a little bit, especially since there's some of you that haven't been here for the other two sessions. Um, those are online if you want to go back and watch them later on. He tells us what to do and why to do it. He says, put on the whole armor of God so we can stand against the wiles of the devil. Now, just a couple of minutes ago, I sat here and I asked, does anybody have requests? And there was names all through the house of sickness, of people in our lives that we know are, are struggling, um, some of us kept our hands down, and really it's because we're the ones struggling, and we don't want to raise our hands and admit it. But God knows it, and I still encourage you to turn it over to him. But it all comes down to the fact that we are dealing with spiritual warfare, and we're all struggling with the wiles of the devil. Now, Paul is writing this to Christians. See, Scripture never tells us that if we become a Christian, it's going to be an easy life. It's the exact opposite of it. But what he does do is say, as a Christian, I'm going to tell you how to withstand. And he talks about the whole armor. 
that we have to have every single piece. Because if you're missing a piece, where's the enemy going to strike at? If you're vulnerable somewhere, where do you think Satan is going to aim? And so that's why we're doing this. That's why it's important for us to go through every single one of these and to understand what it is and how to wear it. So over the last two weeks, um, we covered, starting at verse 14, stand therefore having your loins girt about with truth. So we discussed the act of girding up your loins, of preparation, of preparing, and we're going to see that even more today. And specifically, gird up your loins with truth, with God's truth, with the word. How important that is. And then the second half of that verse, last week we covered it having on the breastplate of righteousness. Once you learn the truth, living a righteous life is living by the standard of that truth. We have to know what God's standard is, and then we live by it. And we talked about the breastplate and how it protects us. And today we are on to verse 15. And your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. So now we're talking about shoes. Now I have a picture here. This is a picture of the shoes or the sandals that a Roman soldier would wear. As Paul is in prison, as he's writing this, and he's standing next to this Roman guard getting his inspiration from their armor, I'm sure. And he's looking at all of the pieces and the significance of them and what they do. And so he tells us to put on our shoes. Now something very unique about these shoes, as you'll see on the soles of them, they are studded, sort of like a pair of cleats today. They would take nails and drive them in and have some kind of spikes there so they would grip the ground. So they would provide stability. Now, just through this passage, I want you to focus on the emphasis Paul gives to standing. Verse 11, put on the whole armor of God that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Verse 13, wherefore take unto you the whole armor of God that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand. And he says, then once you've done all to stand, stand therefore. Once you've done all to stand, stand therefore with the armor. Stand, stand, stand. Stand or withstand. Now, I know this is a football-loving church. Okay, so I want you to think of a football game. In a football game, I want you to think of the linebackers, the people right up front, the people right, right in the middle of the field. See, I'm about 6'1 and 250 pounds worth of fat, if I'm being honest. Um, and it, these guys are, are about 6'5 and 300 pounds full of muscle. Okay, these are some, some big dudes. These are some big guys. And what happens is they line up, and you have one guy trying to go this way, and one guy trying to go this way, and as soon as that play starts, they collide. And in reality, they don't go anywhere most of the time, because they just stand there trying to push through the other person. But they can only stand their ground like that because they put their shoes on it. Because they have their cleats on. See, if they went out there in their pair of sneakers, oh, they'd get pushed halfway across the field. But because they prepared themselves and shod their feet with the right footwear for the right situation, they are able to stand their ground. And not only are they able to stand, they are able to withstand the oppression from the other person. And this is what Paul tells us that we can do 
if we shod our feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Now these cleats really provide two things. They provide stability and mobility. And we're going to talk about both of those today. So we know what the shoes are. We know what the purpose is. We can envision it. We can imagine it. See, and this is our armor. This is for our protection against the wiles of the devil. Now, back in that day, you know, today if you go out of warfare and they put landmines in the street. They set traps. Back then they would sharpen the ends of sticks and stick them in the ground so that you'd step on them and they'd pierce your foot. If you don't have the right footwear, it doesn't matter how armored up you are. If you're barefoot and you step on a spike, you're out. You can't fight anymore. You can't stand anymore. You can't defend. You can't go on the offense. You're done. So he tells us, shot your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Now there's three words that I want to focus on here. One's preparation, one's gospel, and one is peace. And those are the categories we're going to cover. So the preparation we've kind of talked about a little bit. It is the same as girding up your loins. It is preparing yourself. In this situation, preparing yourself with the gospel. With the gospel of peace. The second thing is the gospel. As Christians, it seems silly for me to ask this question. But if we're being honest, there's a lot of people that don't even really know what the gospel is. What is the gospel? How do we prepare ourselves with the gospel? Now, of course, I'm going to keep beating this into you until you understand. And I've been doing this this whole series. Is it all comes down to this. If you want to armor up, pick up the book. If you want to armor up, seek God. Go to him in prayer. Study. Learn the gospel. Now, when Jesus was tempted in the wilderness, he said he had been fasting, he's hungry, he's physically kind of weak. And that's when Satan chooses to go and say, hey, I'm going to tempt this person. So Satan comes and he tempts Jesus. The only defense Jesus had was the gospel, was the word. Every answer Jesus gave was, well, it is written. It is written. It is written. That's why it's so important for us to understand this, for us to learn this. For us to know what it says, to understand the gospel, and to guard ourselves with the gospel. See, Satan's traps in this world come down to making you doubt your salvation, making you doubt God, making you doubt your place. Now, as a Christian, I want to be very clear. Satan cannot take your salvation from you. And he knows he can't take your salvation from you. But what he can do is stop you from progressing in your walk with Christ. The traps that he sets up and the, the walls that he puts up and the gates he puts up and, and all of the obstacles that he puts in your life is only there to stop you from progressing. To stop you from fulfilling the life that God has for you. Or fulfilling the plan that God has for you. Fulfilling the work that God has for you. It's to stop you. He can't take your soul away from God anymore. But he can sure stop you from reaching your neighbor's soul. And so we have to understand the gospel as our defense. We have to understand God's truth. Where all of these things go together. Once we understand the gospel and we wrap our lives in truth, 
and we live righteously, only then can we be protected. Now, let's look at peace, and peace is where we're going to spend the majority of our time here this morning. What is peace? I'm going to put it simply, peace is simply the opposite of worry. We've all worried. If you know what worry is, it's the opposite of that. Don't do that no more. you got peace. It's calm. It's tranquility. But it's a special kind of peace that we're after. It's the special kind of peace that gives us stability, just like the cleats on the bottom of the Roman soldier's shoes. And that peace comes from Jesus. In John, he writes, Peace I leave with you, my peace I give unto you, not as the world giveth, give I unto you. Let your heart, or let not your heart be troubled. Neither let it be afraid. This is a very specific peace of Jesus. He said, peace I live with you, my peace I give you. Right? It's the kind of peace, he, he writes this on his, as he is on his way to the cross, is when he's speaking this to his disciples. It's that kind of peace. It's that kind of peace that says, I'm facing death right now, but I'm okay with it. I don't like it. I don't like the situation. You know, may this cup pass from me, but I'm okay with it. I'll accept it because God is in control and I have peace in my life because this is the Father's plan. Because I am in the Father's hands. This is the kind of peace that Jesus is leaving us. This is the kind of peace that provides stability in our lives. There was once a uh, in our context. And they were offering prize money for the painting that best represented peace. And really it came down to two submissions. The first one was perfect tranquility. It was a painting of a lake, crystal clear water, clear skies with the sun just shimmering over the, the lake. There's a meadow next to it with a shepherd with his sheep. There's a couple of trees with birds sitting in the branches singing songs and doing what birds do. This perfect just calmness and just serene. And the other painting was the exact opposite of that. It was dark and there's stormy clouds and, and lightning coming down and thunder rolling and the there's a couple of ships on the lake and the they're getting tossed and turned by the waves and it was just this dark gloomy picture and then right in the corner down in the left there's a tree there with a little bird sitting on the branch singing a song Twittering like birds do, and one ray of sunshine coming through the clouds, just lighting down on that little bird. And that is true peace. That's the painting that won the contest. That's the kind of peace that we're after. When everything else around us is chaotic, and we are still calm, and we still have God's light coming down on us. And we can still sing songs and be happy and sing praise. That is the kind of peace that keeps us stable in this world. Right. See, it's easy for us to be peaceful when nothing's wrong, right? When it's perfect tranquility in our life. If nothing's wrong and you're worrying, there's, there's another problem going on. You, you have some serious problems then, right? Because it's easy to be peaceful when your life is peaceful, but life is never peaceful, is it? Life doesn't stay that way. Life gets chaotic. And we have to have stability in the gospel. 
and then we find peace in our lives. The peace of Jesus, not as the world gives you. See, the world will give you peace. The world will give you, you know, a new job. The world will tell you, hey, you just need more money so you can go on better vacations. That will bring peace to your life. Well, you just need to take another drink or you just need to smoke another cigarette or, um, you know, you just need to pop another pill. You know, and I'm not saying you know, you're going to go out and start popping Vicodin either. But the world will also offer you temporary peace and things like Prozac. Other anxiety medications. The world will tell you, I have a solution for your worry, the solution for your anxiety, and it's temporary. And here's the big difference between the world's peace and God's peace. See, the world's peace is outside in. God's peace is from the inside. Amen. I want you to turn with me real quick. Keep your finger in Ephesians. Turn with me to Matthew chapter 8. Matthew chapter 8, starting in verse 23. Jesus is with his disciples. And it says that, And when he was entered into the ship, his disciples followed him. And behold, there arose a great tempest in the sea, insomuch that the ship was covered with the waves, but Jesus was asleep. And his disciples came to him and awoke him, saying, Lord, save us, or we perish. And he said unto them, Why are ye fearful, O ye of little faith? Then he arose and rebuked the winds and the sea, and there was a great calm. But the men marveled, saying, What manner of man is this, that even the winds and the sea obey him? See, this is the kind of peace that we have when we have stability in the gospel, when we come to Jesus. When Jesus says, I'm going to leave you my peace, it's when there's a huge storm, and the waves are coming up over the top of the ship, and you're sleeping while everybody else is panicking and thinking, it's over. It's done. Life is done. Now, if you don't think spiritual warfare is real, if you don't think this stuff is real, I just want you to take a hard look at our world recently. Not even just our world, let's cut it down to our country. Just over the last two years, just over the last five years, there's pictures that I'm going to be honest with you the Republican side of me makes me very happy there's a picture on the night Trump was elected of multiple of you know Democrats and specifically there's one picture that goes around on the internet of this woman who is just crying and screaming into the sky because her life was over because Trump was president and the Republican in me is like ha 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 you know <laughs> But the Christian in me breaks for that girl. Because she's so lost. She's so lost. She was in this moment just like the disciples. They thought life was over. But the Christians were just asleep because they had peace. And they know none of it really matters. It doesn't matter who's in office if you're a Christian. Because you don't follow them, you follow God. You don't get your stability from the state, you get your stability from the gospel of Jesus Christ, from the gospel of peace. 
You slump over, let's fast forward a little bit, look through COVID, look through the riots on Black Lives Matter, look through the people marching in the streets right now over abortion because of the Supreme Court, de uh, the, the Supreme Court decision, I'm tongue-tied, I can't talk. Over and over and over again, we see the world's peace, which is non-existent. And we see people just like the disciples who think life is over if we can't stop this happening right now. And us Christians, we fall into that same trap. We fall into that same trap because peace is not our default and it should be as Christians. See, we fall into the trap. That's the trap Satan has laid. That's the wiles of the devil. That's where he wants us. Is he wants worry to be our default. He wants worry and anxiety to be the thing that is most natural to us. And if that's true, there's something wrong spiritually. Something is out of line. If God's peace is not the default in your life, then you are out of line spiritually. Amen. See, it's this peace, like in Philippians, it tells us, and the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. That's the kind of peace. Peace that we can't even understand ourselves as Christians. We just know that it's there. We just know God has it. I don't understand the situation happening in my life right now. I don't understand why bad things keep happening around me or to me. I don't understand why someone got a diagnosis for cancer. Or I don't understand why I was in a car accident. Or I don't understand why, insert blank, it doesn't matter. As Christians, we have peace in the situation because we know God has it. And that is surrounding ourselves with truth. That is living righteously. And that is securing our feet, getting stability in the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, you're already in Matthew. I want you to turn a couple of pages to Matthew chapter 5. I told you we were going to talk about stability. And now we're going to talk a little bit about mobility. See, I gave you the analogy of the football field. Well, it's not just those guys trying to run through each other. And there's also the wide receiver or the running back who his job is to go. If you have the ball, you run as fast as you can possibly run, you move to the other end of the field. And he also has to have sure footing for that process. Just like the soldier, when he marches into combat, he can't be slipping and sliding as he's trying to fight people with a sword. It doesn't work that way. Your opponent will knock you down, and he will end your life. Matthew chapter 5, verse 9. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. Now I want to focus in on this word, peacemakers. Now notice this is peacemaker, not peacekeeper. Because there's a big difference there. This is the mobility aspect of these shoes, of our protection. This is the go, if you will. Now, a peacekeeper is someone who will look at this Russia, Ukraine conflict, and we'll go, please stop shooting at each other. Please, we just need peace. Please just stop. That's a peacekeeper. We've all been peacekeepers at a time where we know there's something, uh, conflict between us and another person, but we just kind of let it hang there. It's like, well, it's kind of calm right now, so I just won't bring attention to it. I won't stir the pot. We're just gonna leave it be and be a peacekeeper. We're just I don't want I don't want to deal with the conflict. So you just let it sit there. But nothing ever gets resolved that way. See, a peacemaker is someone who goes to Russia and Ukraine and says, okay, first you gotta stop shooting at each other. Now, how do we get along? That's a lot different, isn't it? 
That has a whole different tone to it. That's the mobility part of this. Is if we know there's conflict with somebody in our lives, we go to that person. And we see how do we get along? How do we fix this? Not how do we manage it? Not how do we just keep the peace? How are we peacemakers? What can we do to change, fundamentally change this dynamic that we are in right now? That's what Jesus blesses. See, as a Christian, a situation should improve simply because you are involved in it. If you are in tune spiritually, if you are armored up every day, you know the gospel, you've surrounded yourself with truth, you're living a righteous life, if you've taken up all of the pieces, situations will just get better because you're involved. You'll be able to go to somebody's house and go, well, there's chaos here. I can bring peace. I can help bring calm and order. See, some of you, some of you know that when you get involved in a situation, things get a lot more chaotic. And I think we've all been there at some point or another where we may try to help. Or, you know, we may think we're helping, but as soon as we step in and we get involved, man, things go crazy. They blow up in our face and, you know, it just makes you think, well, I don't even know why I try that anymore. I'm just going to, I'm just going to just stay out of everybody else's business. I'm just going to keep to myself. Well, that's the wiles of the devil. That's what Satan wants. I mean, quite frankly, you weren't, you weren't writing your own life before you went and tried to help some else in theirs. So what do we do with this? We know what the shoes are. We know what we can receive from them. We can see how being a peaceful person, having God's peace in our lives can protect us and protect us from Satan. But how do we actually armor up? How do we put on the shoes? And that's what we're going to close with here today. This is the the last verse I'm going to have you turn to, and then we're going to wrap it up. Turn to Colossians chapter 3. If you kept your finger in Galatians, it's just a couple more pages. Or Ephesians, sorry. You have Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians. Colossians chapter 3. Colossians chapter uh, 3 verse 15 tells us that let the peace of God rule in your hearts to which also we are called in one body and be thankful. And really this is simple. Let the peace of God rule in your hearts and it comes down to this. If God rules in your life, then God's peace will rule in your heart. If your default is worry, or if you get involved in situations and they get worse, you're out of tune spiritually. And God is not ruling over your life. It says, let God's peace. God already offered it to us. He already gave it to us. The moment we came to him, the moment we got salvation, he planted that peace in us. But we have to let it rule, just like we have to let God rule. And it comes down to that. If you want peace in your life, if you want defense against the enemy, you have to let God rule. If you want to be a peacemaker, if there's a situation that God's calling you in right now that you just know, man, I know I should get involved in this. But you haven't been, you need to let God rule. 
If worry is your default, if you are constantly filled with anxiety, you need to let God rule. And it keeps coming back to that. Notice every one of these. Truth, righteousness, salvation, the gospel, the sword of the spirit. It all comes back to this over and over and over again. God says, if you want to be protected, pick up the book. If you want victory in your life over all of the stuff that's going on, this is what you need. There are so many prayer requests about people in our lives that we know that simply need salvation. Well, this person's lost. Well, they need it. Well, what are you doing about it? Are you teaching them this? Do you know? Are you prepared to share the gospel? Do you know the gospel to even share it? And this is what I'm going to leave you with. Is that thought. Is God ruling in your life today? Because if not, as Brother Greg comes up and he sings for us, I want to invite you up to the altar. I want to give you the chance to say, God, I want you to rule. God, I want peace in my life. I'm tired of the chaos. I'm tired of the hurt. I'm tired of being tossed and turned. I'm tired of walking barefoot all the time. I'm stepping on every rock and every stick and every trap laid in front of me. I'm tired of getting poked and cut and bit by everything in the path, everything in the road. God, I just need peace. Now's your chance. Come lay it at the feet of Jesus. If there's something between the two of you, come lay it at his feet. Because he'll take it and he'll cast it away.